So I'm pleased to introduce our next uh, presenter on uh, evidence-based approaches for the treatment of anxiety disorders uh, or children and adolescents with anxiety problems or children with anxiety problems. And that's Dr. Wendy Silverman. Wendy is a professor of psychology and, and director of the new clinical training program in child and adolescent clinical science at FIU. Wendy um, has tons of accolades, has served as chairperson of the NIMH Child Intervention Research Panel, that's a grant review panel, been associate editor and editor of a number of the major journals in the field of child clinical psychology, uh, serves on many, edit many editorial boards. She's a past president of Division 53, that is the science of uh, child clinical and adolescent psychology, the Society for Child Clinical and Adolescent Psychology, who's sponsoring the conference, and she was one of the people responsible for the initiation of the conference, as was Dr. Lonigan, by the way, going back to the 90s. So we're really pleased to have Wendy talking about evidence-based approaches for anxiety in kids. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I've been working, as I said, for 20 years. I've had too many graduate students and undergraduates uh, to, to thank, but these are the current uh, group of, uh, this is the current cast of characters. Um, and um, also my colleagues who I collaborate with, Jim Jackson and Bill Katinas. Also, many of the slides from, for today and tomorrow I've gotten from friends and colleagues. In fact, maybe one of, one of these slides are mine and the rest is everybody else's. No, not really. But, um, but I do want to thank people for sharing their slides with me. So what I will be doing today is talk about why we should treat anxiety disorders in children and describe the EBTs that we have for anxiety. Then I'm going to describe the main characteristics of the research, and most of the comparative trials have been ICBT, Individual Cognitive Behavior Therapy versus wait lists, Group Cognitive Behavior Therapy versus wait lists, and then talking about the role of parents. After that, I'm going to tell you what we know about long-term follow-up effects, and then what we know about studies that have looked beyond wait list controls. Then what happens when we add drugs, and then something that I think is particularly interesting is do we have any ideas about why treatment works or what we call outcome mediation trials? And then briefly talk about effectiveness. But the general goal that I, of the talk is I want to really emphasize that there's been a lot of progress that's been made. And we do know quite a bit. However, there's still a lot that we don't know, and I hope to share with you today what it is that we still do not know, and that we still need a, a lot of more, more of a search on efficacy and effectiveness, with each of them informing the other. And I think that's sort of like the big picture of the, of the talk. Um, I agree with what John Curry had said. Um, he said. He said that somebody asked him, well, what do you mean by depression? I actually once gave a talk, and at the end, somebody raised their hand and said, but there really isn't any such thing as anxiety in children. <laughs> so, um, but I guess now that it's in the DSM, it, there is something, it, it, you know, anxiety disorders does exist. And the, the reason why there are the asterisks, those are the uh, uh, disorders that most of the treatments have focused on. So that's the reason why there's an asterisk next to those. And I'm assuming most of you are familiar with um, the characteristics of these disorders. Um, anxiety disorders are considered one of the most, if not the most prevalent anxiety, uh, if not the most prevalent problem of children. In epidemiological studies, they, the rates hover around 10%. Yet, even though they're one of the most common problems, they're also the least likely to be identified and referred than externalizing problems. Um, there was, um, there was a study in Norway, in fact, that actually documented that in Norway, anxiety is the most prevalent problem, but if you look at what gets referred to the community mental health settings, very little in terms of anxiety. And a lot of this is because, as you can imagine, these are internalizing problems. The kids are kind of like silently suffering and are not out there making a lot of noise and a lot of trouble for, for uh, teachers and sometimes not even for their parents, so they go unrecognized. Nevertheless, they're impairing. If you have a separation anxiety, many times these children are sleeping in bed with their parents for many, many years. They're not going out playing with friends. They, they, um, it impacts their friendships, it impacts school, they're, they have trouble concentrating, they're easily distracted, and they're just upset, distressed children. 
And, um, you know, I just realized that my cartoons are not <laughs> in these slides. Let me tell you a joke. <laughs> There's this kid, he's on a, about to go on a school bus, and the father says to the kid, stay away, from the, stay away from the overcrowded classroom, say no to drugs, don't get stabbed, don't get mugged, don't uh, wear your asbestos jacket, don't say hi to strangers, and have a nice day. All right, that was one of the cartoons. <laughs> um, the, the, um, there are also non-remitting disorders, and, that there, and there's possible, um, they're non-remitting disorders, they tend to be a gateway to other problems um, uh, in terms of kids who have anxiety problems, there's usually, it's considered a gateway, a, a risk factor. So typically, you might see specific phobia first, followed by separation anxiety, followed by social anxiety, followed by GAD, panic, and then, as again, as John Kirby mentioned, anxiety is typically preceding depression, and then substance use follows, typically. And we also recently published a study showing that anxiety disorders are also associated with suicidal ideation, even after you remove um, the uh, the factors that relate to depression. So these are non-remitting uh, disorders. So basically, these are kids who are suffering in, in quiet distress. They have significant impairment. The problems don't, do not remit with time. And they're considered a risk factor for other problems, or what you would might call a, a gateway to other problems. Now, there's been well over 40, 25, um, 30, I, I think John Wise had 48 RCTs. There's, there's, you know, there's quite a lot of RCTs now done showing, um, looking at cognitive behavioral treatment. And that is what is the bulk of the literature. Um, and, there's, and there's very little known about other types of treatments, and that certainly is a limitation to the literature, and we certainly need alternative treatments to be exploring, especially the types of treatments that tend to be used a lot in the community, uh, such as play therapy, et cetera. But we just don't have an evidence for these kinds of uh, treatments for anxiety disorders. And um, this is the main components of CBT. Um, and here I have another cartoon. There's a guy out on a uh, out in an elevator, out and out in a box, standing out by a window. With he's in a box, uh, heights, snakes all around him, and they say uh, this is the treatment of fear of uh, heights, snakes, and, and claustrophobia. <laughs> this is working. Okay, <laughs> telling jokes without cartoons. Anyway, so that was a good joke. Um, um, and then there's another joke that I have. Uh, no. <laughs> Did you hear the one about? No, okay. Um, sorry. And then there's behavioral and cognitive and emotional. And, you know, and there is a, a component of emotions. Uh, people, uh, there's a, a big focus on linking behaviors and feelings, thoughts to feelings. So it's not simply as cognitive as people might think. There's a lot of emotional processing. Kids cry, kids get upset. There's clearly um, a lot of emotion work going on. And there's a lot of so social stuff going on if you're involving parents and peers. So that was the joke for the exposure. And this is what we use um, for STOP to help kids recognize, to deal with their thoughts. We use an acronym helping them to know if they're scared, what are their thoughts, what are their other thoughts, what other things can they do, and they praise themselves. And this is part of a self-control strategy that's used along with exposure. So it's CBT, behavioral, cognitive, emotional, and social. What does the research look like? Well, basically what we see is we mainly have clinic-referred participants from schools and the community. Uh, the participants are randomized. I already mentioned the most common treated disorders are these. Uh, most of the uh, studies have used an interview schedule that I developed um, along with Anne-Marie Albano, um, which has good reliability. The studies all have multi-source, multi-method assessments. The treatments are manualized, about 12 to 16 meetings. This, uh, the treatments are delivered the way they're supposed to be delivered, so we're not doing 
in psycho psychoanalytic interpretations, we're doing exposures, we're doing self-control strategies. Um, the therapists are well-trained, they're supervised, they're follow-up procedures. As I said, most of the studies have used wait lists. So this is the general look of an anxiety treatment study. And when you look at the results, when you compare individual, this is a child working alone with a therapist with minimal involvement of parents, or when you look at the studies that have compared, put kids together in a group, kids with mixed diagnoses, usually of mixed ages, and compare them to a wait list, what do we find? Clinician improvement ratings improve, recovery rates improve, usually 60 to 80% of the children show improvement, which means 20 to 40% are not improving. <laughs> so we still have, uh, I think, uh, a great deal of room for improvement there. The, yeah, the self ratings uh, show improvement with generally medium effect sizes. The parents, talk about improvements. The few studies that have teacher ratings report improvements. Uh, Phil Kendall has a co measures coping, and he reports coping skills improve, behavior observations improve, and the kids are no longer in the clinical range. So that's, in the gist of it, I just summarized about 30 studies for you. You don't have to read 30 studies. No, 20 studies. That's about the results of about, you know, 20 studies right there. And they're pretty, you know, consistent findings. This is Phil Kendall's first, um, you know, the, the first study ever published um, where red is the wait list and black is the treatment kids. So, you know, the wait list kids, nothing happens to them and the treated kids show improvements. And in follow-up, where these kids are pooled together, you see the continued improvement. Um, we did also one of the first studies with group cognitive behavior therapy. And again, we found the same uh, significant treatment by time interaction where the group goes improves and significantly more than the wait list. And again, I could put up 15, 20 slides and show you these types of treatment by time interactions with the wait list. In fact, um, he's another one. <laughs> um, and, and, and the same thing with payment ratings, showing that same improvement, that same interaction. Um, so that's that. Now, what about minority samples? And I must say, I think this is a bit of a, an, a, this is an area where we need a lot of improvement. If you look at the anxiety literature, almost the majority of the studies contain white European American children. That's, that's what it is. I mean, and you know, you're talking about studies that maybe have less than 5% of minority populations. I'm very proud to say that we probably see more Latinos here at FIU than any other place in, in the country, if not the world, and this is what our samples now look like. Habla um, espanol un poco. Um, but uh, mi espanol es getting mejor. Porque muy importante, porque es necesario. So, um, and, and when we look at the Latinos and the European Americans, we find, we, we published a paper a few years ago, um, and, and we've been looking at, still at our results, and I promise you, I did not fix these data. I promise you. This is what we're finding. We're finding uh, what we call not just no significant differences, we're finding statistical equivalence. I mean, these are really tight. This is true for the PAM ratings. No significant differences and statistical uh, equivalence. So, I'm not going to say anything more than what the data we have, which is that at least here with our largely acculturated uh, Cuban-American children that we see at FIU, what we're doing is working. And we, we're not finding that we need to make any differences. Uh, you know, and many of my students habla espanol, and they frequently habla espanol con uh, the parents of the niños. So that's, that's <laughs> no, and this, and this is, impo this is important. Well, what about long-term effects? Long-term effects, uh, when we, we, there have been four published studies now uh, looking at the effects five to eight years post-treatment. And these are the um, studies that looked at these kids. So this is after treatment ends, what do the kids look like five to eight years later? Most of these children are no longer children. They're now 18 to 20. Most of them are uh, late adolescents, early adults. 
by the time these people are in this, these studies. I'm just going to show you the one that uh, we did. This was Lizette Saavedra, which was actually an NIMH dissertation award that she got to follow some of the kids. And basically what we found, um, and, and I really didn't borrow, these are not Kendall's data and I just put my name on it. <laughs> Although if I put up Kendall's data, it would look more or less the same as well. Because basically what we found was uh, after five, all these years later, there was very little in terms of the targeted anxiety disorder was gone. There was no new anxiety disorders, you know, 85% no uh, depression and no substance use. And the clinician and the rating scales also showed, I think similar to what John Weiss was showing, you know, showing some continued um, positive effects on the rating scales. Now having said that, that that's good news, I do need to make the point that none of these studies had a, a control group of untreated anxious youth. And that's a big limitation. Um, you can imagine the, the ethical issues in trying to get it, you know, following many years uh, in this way. But I, I do want to make the point, I started from the beginning by saying most studies, when you look at prospective studies, not in comparison to treated, most of the times anxiety disorders do not remit. They continue, this, you know, and if you ask adults, you know, how long have you been anxious, they'll say all their lives. So even though these studies are lacking control groups, if you look at other types of evidence, the evidence is such that usually people don't look so great if they don't get their anxiety disorders treated. So even though I make that limitation, I have to make it like it's not such a big limitation. Now what about involving parents? So um, I did check with John Weiss before I came up here because I didn't want to look stupid. So he agreed with me that I wasn't stupid. He said in his poem that I'm smart. Right, John? Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm going to continue to say what I was going to say. Uh, um, even though I understand when you look across all those studies and with the meta-analyses and combine the studies and combine the ratings and combine the sources, there is that type of evidence that perhaps adding parents might enhance. But I would like to say that if you look more carefully at, the, at each individual study where they actually manipulated, the evidence is not bad, it's just inconsistent. Um, and it's, it's just a failure to demonstrate consistent. When I say consistent, I mean some studies find effects, some studies don't. Some studies find it on some measures, some studies don't find it on the same measures. And then uh, we did, um, and then when looking across some of the studies, you know, in terms of larger group analyses, that seems to be the same thing. Um, now, I do have a great cartoon that I want to share with you, and it's these penguins, and they're on an iceberg. And, the, and these two penguins are saying, Ollie, you know, they're going to say, I'm going to go to the North Pole, and I'm going to go and visit Ollie. And the other penguin says, how are you going to know which one is Ollie? There's a million penguins in the North Pole. And the other penguin says, oh, well, he, Ollie is the one with the overprotective mom. And then there's gonna be a cartoon with this penguin all covered up with like winter clothes and earmuffs and scarves. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great cartoon. Um, and, and this is um, showing that, yeah, you know, of course, a lot of these parents are overprotective. So, yeah, you need to get these parents involved. But, you know, when you think about it the other way, you could also say, look, if you've got to teach kids CBT, do you really want to get the parents in there as well, especially if they're anxious, and try to teach these parents certain things? Maybe it is a little bit too much and a little bit too distracting. And it's possible that's why, you know, the effects are not always so clear, that maybe we're trying to do too much you know, as much as parents play a role in maintaining anxiety, which, I, which we know they do, parents play a role in maintaining anxiety, the question is, if they're so anxious, et cetera, could that be making it even more difficult to work with, the, uh, get effects with children? We, we don't know. All I can tell you is what our, some of our studies, where we did CBT alone, and, we comp and this was CBT with parents, and CBT alone was minimal involvement with parents. CBT with parents was every single session, the child and the parent met with the therapist and did CBT, and we trained parents in some other things, which I'll talk about later. 
But this is the point. No significant differences um, um, on, in either condition. When the parents rated the children anxiety, again, no significant differences. Um, and the child internalizing, again, no significant differences. And again, if this was just my study, I would say, well, it, you know, it's Silverman's study, so who knows? But as I said, there are about 15 other studies that show kind of like really inconsistent findings. Now, of course, these are the sample sizes might question whether or not we can detect significant differences. Um, nevertheless, what's important is that um, you know, at, at least, you know, a lot of this, you know, data are looking, you know, it's, this is not even like uh, anything, but, you know, it's pretty clear from looking at that, the, the, the similarity. So to recap where we are as of now is that ICBT is more effective than wait list. GCBT is more effective than wait list, but there's inconsistent evidence about involving parents. What do we know when we compare CBT to something beyond a wait list? to an active, credible control condition where they're, you know, they're really doing something and they believe that what they're doing is therapeutic. And we actually did uh, one of the first studies um, to look at um, this question where we compared behavior therapy where t parents were taught child management skills to do exposures, cognitive where kids were taught self-control skills to do exposure, and this was designed as a placebo. It was no, it was meeting every week with a therapist, learning about phobias, how do they develop, what maintains them, what types of things help with phobias, but absolutely no prescription, no skills training, no homework, nada. And what we found was across all the rating scales, again, the sample, the power to detect differences, you know, is, you know, is not there um, necessarily. These are medium effect sizes. But the point is, even in ed support, the kids are showing improvements. Everybody's showing declines. And this was a consistent rating on all of our rating scales, on all the measures. The only thing where it wasn't was with the uh, diagnoses. Um, and, and this could have easily been a child in any of those three conditions. And I wish, and, and just to show, and it's not just this picture, Golda Ginsburg was, one of, was a postdoc with me at the time, and I still clearly remember her showing me, look at this nice t-shirt I got from a parent. I said, oh, that's nice. And it was a gift because they were so happy with the treatment. And then she said, education support. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> so, um, you know, that, and, um, and there have been other findings like that. Cynthia Lass, who was at NOVA, who used my manual, I shared my manual with her, she did the same, found the same thing, kids were going back to school, the kids went back to school. Phil Kendall, just recently published in JCCP, family cognitive behavior therapy versus cognitive behavior therapy versus ed support. He found differences on the diagnostic recovery rates, but he found no differences among the conditions on youth mother and, and father and teacher ratings. Tom Allendick, again, also recently published something with single, he does a single, he treats a phobia in six hours. And then he compared um, that with providing education support in six hours and a wait list. And again, no differences, but there were differences on diagnostic recovery rates. Why is this? I believe CBT works. <laughs> But I also believe that there are probably many ways we can deliver the procedures that work. And it's very possible, in fact, what I believe, in, uh, Kendall in his article talks about bleeding. But basically what it means is probably in education support, you have the ingredients and the procedures are being explained. And it's being explained in a therapeutic context. And if people are suffering and hurting and in distress, they're going to do things to improve. And so I believe that that's partly exp explains that which, um, and you know, this is this idea that we can be flexible perhaps in how we deliver our evidence-based procedures. But it also highlights the importance of trying to understand why change occurs, which I'm going to speak about in a few minutes. Now, what do we know when we compare CBT to drugs? Um, and the most important study is the one that just got published. It's the CAM study which is a multi-site study with Duke University, Columbia, UCLA, and um, Temple. And they compared sertraline with CBT with combination with pill placebo. 
And this was a significant difference that you had fewer kids in CBT dropping out, only six kids. And you can see the differences with the other, you know, 13, 23, 15. And this is a total sample size of 40, 488 across the four sites. And what their findings were on the Clinician Global Index, which you saw other people presenting results on this, co combined was the best, no, and, and they were better than these conditions, but there were no significant differences between these two. These were equal, considered to be equivalent, and, more, and better than the placebo. And the same is true with this rating scale. Again, the combined was better than CBT, but CBT and SORT and the drug were statistically non-significant, but everything was better than the placebo. The CAMS people, their conclusion is this. We have three treatments that work, but combination is better. That's their conclusion. Um, I just would li just like to point out that there are some limits to that study, which I think we still need a lot more research, namely that the children in the combined com treatment were unblinded. They knew they were getting CBT and they knew they were getting a drug versus the other, uh, the placebo condition were blind. So this was the only condition where the children and the parents were not blinded. Um, another lim limitation as of now, it's just those two outcomes have been reported. Plus, it's only up until 14 weeks, the, the post-treatment. Now they have funding to do a follow-up. And we still need to be looking at all the other rating scales. They haven't published that yet, and we also don't know anything about potential site differences, which might exist. And the other point to be made is a dose effect. 14 sessions, 8 sessions, 8 sessions, 14 plus 8. 14 plus 8, that's what? That's 22. <laughs> so there's also that. And then, the, you know, there's other questions that need to be explored, like such as does it make a difference which comes first or second? That's, these are different questions. But I do want to make the point, I, I guess I'm saying that because, um, you know, I think the jury is not yet out about the, the uh, relative benefits of doing a combined or even um, um, doing a combined approach. Now, uh, another drug study was with social phobia. Debbie Vidal did this study where she did social effectiveness training. This is basically doing, ex this is a behavioral treatment. Exposures and teaching kids social skills and to generalize that to different peers. Double blinded. And again, uh, more dropout in the pill. And these were Debbie's findings um, where the, the behavior therapy approach it's significantly better than the, uh, the Prozac. This is the, and this was true as well, where um, the, the, uh, the behavior therapy did significantly better than the drug, which did significantly better than the placebo. Uh, okay. Well, the, so the main, this is the main point then, that we need more work in this area. And, and at least with social phobia, the evidence is that the behavioral approach works better, but we, don't, we need to know, do more research on combined. My other cartoon, and this is a great cartoon. There's a whale, and he's out of the water. He's not in the water, he's out sunbathing in the beach. And, <laughs> and the photographers are all taking pictures of him. And then it says underneath, your theories are all very interesting, but the truth is, we just like to be on TV. <laughs> so what does that mean? That means that we think we have theories <laughs> why the whale is out of the water, but we don't really know why the whale is out of the water. We think we have theories why the kids in CBT may be getting better, but we don't really know why the kids in CBT is getting better. Um, so for example, the Ed Support research shows that. And why is it important? Well, I think this is critical. Now, of course, I think it's critical because this is the work I do. <laughs> and, and, I, and every researcher thinks that their work is critical. But I really do believe that if we know how treatments work, I would be able to do my, I don't need to do two days, no offense, guys, doing a workshop. I could go in there and in one hour, or two hours, or three hours, I say, this is what works, do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have to give you all this other stuff that may or may not work. That's why we need 
to know what works <laughs> because it's going to have lead to streamlined treatments and you know less is we've heard before but I truly am a believer that less is more especially in this day and age of accountability and etc and and it's just is a really important question and you know John Weiss you know did publish a fabulous paper and if I had more time John I always summarize your paper with Robin Wiersing where he showed, and it hasn't gotten better, John did a review uh, in 2005, I think it was, and he said only at that time, maybe, uh, oh, was it six, eight, 12 studies <laughs> ever looked at mediation. And I've looked at it since John, and it's gotten to be no more than five in terms of, and, what, and, and for those of you who may not be familiar with this term, this means we have a treatment, CBT, and our outcome is reduced anxiety. The mediator is what is it, this treatment has to affect something, this has to change. And it's this mediator, the change on this, is going to make our anxiety go down. This is how we build a theory. We need a treatment, we have an outcome, but what is it? What is it about that treatment? That's what everyone's asking. And this is the way you do this. Now, we've done a study. We did a, this is the first study. It was published, um, it was funded very lightly, um, not funded sufficiently at the time. But we began testing our theory. And we have a theory, and this is this, where we have individual therapy, and we have that intense parent-child parent working together in the same room, in the meeting. I told you that working intensely. And we trained everybody in CBT, but we measured these variables in all these conditions. And this is our theory. Our theory is, if you train in this, in this group, parents may improve in this. But you're not even meeting with the parents here. So the parents, nothing should happen to the parents because you're not even meeting with the parents. Here, you're working on the relationship in this condition. So this should improve, and we think this matters, and this should affect anxiety. Here, we're not doing anything, so this shouldn't make any difference. You, are you following this logic? With here, PAM and anxiety, we targeted it, so this should improve here, but here we never touched it. So our theory is, is that in this condition, this is changing, and this leads to improvement, in this condition, this is changing, and this leads to improvement. In this condition, this is changing, and this leads to improvement. In this condition, we're not even touching it. So it shouldn't make a difference. That's the theory we had. Well, in, I'm, I'm, I can't show you, I, I want to just give you the gist of what we're finding, what we found was that even when we had nothing to do with the parents, the kids who hadn't, the parents, the kids thought their parents were behaving better and the relationship was improved. And so we found, we didn't, we found that this was improving even when we didn't touch it. And this is now time for you to have an anxiety attack, okay? Okay. Stop. Scared? No. Thoughts, other thoughts, Wendy will explain it to you. It's really very simple, okay? <laughs> All this is saying is that this is significant. And this means that as the parent, and what we found is in both conditions, individual and CBT, in both conditions, as the parents changed at post, as those parent variables that I told you changed, child anxiety improved. But in both conditions, okay? Not in all the variables, but I just want to give you the gist, the big, but when we also looked, as the children improved, the parents improved. In other words, maybe as the kid's anxiety is going down, the parents are improving. It's not necessarily changing the parents that's leading to the child change. And this is what's most interesting. As the kids at post changed, the follow-up parents change. So as kid anxiety change, parents change. But this is what's really important. As parents changed at the end of treatment, there was no change in the child anxiety. So 
this is the this is the, the gist of it, is that it's the first to suggest that, you know, things are complicated, that maybe it's that as children change, uh, that ch it's the children that are changing and changes occur in their parents, not necessarily that when you work and treat all these and do all these things with the parents, that the changes are occurring in the children. It could be bi-directional effects. But it's really, this is the big point, that it highlights the importance of not accepting common assumptions about the role of parents and about mediators. And I don't have time, but we now have done, we just finished now, we've gotten, we've gotten two really large R01 grants to look more carefully at this. We just finished one, we're in the middle of another one, and we're looking at it much, 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 much more carefully in a more uh, systematic way. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll get a handle on that. And we're also looking at other things besides anxiety. We're also looking at um, other outcomes. So it's important to conduct outcome mediation trials to understand um, key change producing procedures. And because I believe if we know what produces change, then we can improve our EBTs. And for example, if we know more carefully what it is parents are doing, what they need to do, then we could train more carefully. And it also highlights the importance of studying mediators and not to make assumptions about our treatments. Um, and this is the last point I want to make, that I believe it's especially important to know what leads to change, because when, um, you know, there's now been a movement, as you know, to do community effectiveness studies, to take what we do at FIU and do it in some of your sites out in the community. And um, I, 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 this is a little bit confusing, but the point, this is the, uh, again, what, what this slide is showing is that these these slides are from the same studies. Basically, and I do, ha and John, I have your study up there. I hope it's okay because I wanted to show that you found the same thing with depression, which is that even that there are no significant differences when when you look at these studies, which are the same studies, or these studies, which are the same studies, or these studies. There are no significant differences when you compare CBT to the usual care. Now. Thank goodness, um, you know, this is John, though, however, did make this point. Um, I think John did, or Michael Southam Giro did, somebody did, <laughs> that um, if you look at those studies, it's, it's, it's more complicated. 41% of those kids in the usual care got more than just CBT. They got concurrent services. They got other things. So it's possible that it was this concurrent services that suggest that maybe CBT is more effective because you didn't need to supplement it. And it was really unclear what, the, what, was, what got supplemented in the usual care. But again, it highlights that if we know what is happening in these uh, treatments, we would have maybe um, better effects out at these, you know, very, very initial preliminary studies in the community. So um, I'm going to end now and just make these conclusions. CBT has the most evidence. If anybody asked me what should you do with an anxious child, I would say without a blink, CBT. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for 20 years plus, and I wouldn't be doing it if I wasn't getting these fabulous letters and, you know, from parents thanking me and telling us how grateful they were. And it's so rewarding to see the a positive change that goes with these kids. That's why I like working with anxious kids, because you see the changes. So, I, and, and the data supports that, my, my clinical feelings and, and my heart. But having said that, um, we, you know, we need to know more what leads to effects, especially given the education support findings. It suggests to me that we can be flexible in how we implement things. Um, it highlights the need to study more about the role of parents, because I explained to you that what we're finding, and, and we're beginning to still find this, is some suggestion that it may not be as straightforward as children uh, training parents leads to a child changing, but just as likely that as children improve, their parents are changing. So that's, uh, or at least some, something more complicated than a straightforward um, relationship. Medication, 
the camps people, all my, some of my best friends were on the camp study. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not afraid to say that I would like to see, um, you know, I think the limits of that study are important to note. I think it's a problem when people are not blinded to a combined a approach and they know that they're getting a drug and the other people uh, uh, don't know that. And I think the limited studies and we need to see more what happens with the post and the, uh, with the other measures and the follow-up. And, um, and again, the effectiveness trials suggest that we need to know more about what's happening. And there's also some really exciting, innovative approaches going on with the, the use of virtual reality for exposures and the use of computer-assisted work to do exposures. Um, and I hope, and I'm really excited to spend another uh, 20 years doing this work. And, I'm, and I, I, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.